This morning, it's Sophia Gaston, who's the director of the British foreign policy group Think Tank, and Lionel Barber, former editor of the Financial Times. Good morning to you both. Morning, Jenny. Morning. Um, so let's start with that scheme to match families uh, with uh, Ukrainian refugees. Households will be paid £350 a month uh, and have to accommodation have to offer accommodation for at least uh, six months. Lionel, what do you make of this? Do you think this is uh, solving uh, the, the Home Office's problem in terms of, of not being able to come up with a solution to the refugee crisis? Well, I'm tempted to call it a halfway house, but... Uh, not meant as a joke, actually. It, this is a, a compromise because the government doesn't want free movement. Uh, it doesn't want to adopt uh, the model that's been um, pursued successfully in, on the European continent. And therefore, it's offering this, this scheme for, for £350 a month. Now, you know, I would have thought a lot of people with houses, they've got space, they probably don't need that money and there's scope for fraud. Uh, so I really, I don't think much of it. Um, and I think it's much more important to get people, reunite families, um, and then rely on the goodwill of the British people and use money to help with the consequences of the war in other areas like higher energy prices. Sophia, the um, conversation last week was very much of, of was the Home Office's response or, or inability to respond, was it cock-up or conspiracy? And uh, I found, certainly, listening uh, to Sajid Javid there when, when he was asked a question about checks, assuming that the checks were on the, the refugees uh, rather than on the households to house them, it suggests that there is, we have a certain kind of mindset uh, towards refugees, even if they are women and children uh, fleeing a, a conflict that we can all see on our television screens every day. I think that's right. I mean, you know, it's difficult to divorce the way in which the government is approaching this from, you know, this very sensitive, emotional uh, conversation that we've had as a country for the past decade. Um, and I think, though, there was a little bit of a miscalculation. Um, I think the government very much thinks that what the British people value is control and security. Um, but I think this uh, invasion of Ukraine and the humanitarian crisis, it's inspired. Um, you know, it has really captured the attention of the British people. It's something they feel incredibly invested in and traumatized by. Um, and that it's been quite clear from public opinion polling, and, and I've been doing focus groups on this too, uh, that the British people want a pretty robust response from the UK on, on housing as many refugees as we can. Um, you know, I think it is interesting that Michael Gove has stepped in here. Um, it's almost approaching a question of kind of border management. It's sort of taking it away from that mm. um, and more into the conversation about integration and communities, which, which is also, you know, a theme I think that has been pretty important in our public debate over recent years. So, I mean, I'm, I'm glad this scheme has been set up. I think it's important. It's a little bit late. Um, and I do think it's also really um, upon us to emphasize that while the British people are being very generous, and uh, I think that's wonderful, um, this is also a question about the government, and they need to think about what kind of schemes they can have to bring people here more quickly mm -hmm. uh, outside of needing to wrangle through the bureaucracy of setting up uh, spaces in people's own homes. I think is a really important difference in these refugees. These are refugees from war. And when they, you see them on television, they speak English, they speak French, they play music as their homes are devastated. This is not the same kind of refugees from, from the Middle East. I mean, again, traumatised, difficult, but it, there are language, cultural difficulties. It's not the same with Ukrainians. And, 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 I mean, that is a, an issue that has, has come up quite a lot, though, hasn't it, is the extent to which we are prepared to open our doors for Ukrainians because we see them as, as being maybe more culturally similar mm. or politically similar. But, you know, it is the case that there are uh, refugees from the Middle East with, with many ties to the UK and with uh, who speak English very well. Should we be opening their homes to them? Well, we, 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 we should, but, but and, and I, I don't wish to in any way suggest that one is superior yeah. to another. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that... The, the Ukrainians that we've seen on television, on video, on Instagram, that that it it there's a slightly greater affinity, I think, mm. um, although the common the distress is common. Sophia, um, this is Michael Gove's intervention. Uh, we have a new minister for refugees. Should we infer that Priti Patel is is in a lot of trouble at the moment? 
Well, I don't think she'll be front and center um, in this conversation over the next couple of weeks. I think it's been relatively clever to create that distinction whereby the Home Office is essentially managing security checks of people coming in um, in that kind of very sort of laser focused way that it does. Um, and then you've got this kind of softer underbelly, which is being led uh, from different parts of government. So, I mean, I, I think in a way they're probably looking at this as having a bit of a mix, which is trying to speak to all of the different concerns and impulses of the British people. The big question is, can we redress some of the challenges with agility? Because when people are literally f fleeing for their lives and spilling across borders, um, you know, I mean, it's very interesting. The, uh, the Polish um, leader came out uh, just over the weekend, essentially pushing back on this question about, you know, whether or not there needs to be more security checks. They were just saying that is secondary concern. We're trying to just make sure that we get as many people in as possible and we'll deal with that on the other side. And I'm not sure whether the British system is really able to be geared in a way um, that can support those kind of quick fire actions. The fact is the Home Office is just geared mentally to reducing the number of people coming into this country. And we've had that debate for at least a decade. And it's not surprising, therefore, mm -hmm. that Preeti Patel has been way behind the curve and it's basically been handed over to Michael Gove. Uh, yes. Uh, continue. Uh, some of you commenting already on this. Uh, you can keep uh, sending your comments in 8722. Start your message with the word Times or tweet us at Times Radio. Well, that's Sophia Gaston, who is the director of the British Foreign Policy Group Think Tank, and Lionel Barber, former editor of the Financial Times. We're going to move on to the wider geopolitics of uh, the uh, invasion, a uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, Lionel, you've written that our response to... Uh, Vladimir Putin's invasion has been completely miscalculated and are actually potentially encouraging him to resort to more extreme actions. So what are we doing wrong? Uh, well, that's a slight um, stretch, as we say in the States. Um, I, I, and I want to make clear that Vladimir Putin has fundamentally miscalculated. I mean, if you look at the way the offensive has not worked, mm. it was overly ambitious. The EU this is not some remote bureaucratic actor. It's totally galvanized. He's got sanctions you've ever seen. The, the issue is he's now doubling down mm. and we have a brutal war of attrition, annihilation. And I was raising questions in the article I wrote in The Spectator about, well, is the West really alive to the dangers of escalation? Where are the limits of our assistance to Ukraine? I think the idea floated a couple of weeks ago uh, of a no-fly zone is deeply dangerous. It would bring us in direct conflict with the Russians in airspace. And I think there's a, there is a, obviously, you cannot completely rule out a nuclear uh, uh, option for, for, for Vladimir Putin. I, I think at the moment, mm. it looks like more like medieval siege uh, and is circling, as Anthony Lloyd was saying earlier. But so the, the, the question I was raising is, are, is the West really alert to the consequences? Are we actually here for the long term? And what about the, the, the costs of energy? I mean, with this ban, I mean, are we going to have ready for rationing? I don't hear politicians talking about that. So this was what I was saying in terms of the West miscalculating, not fundamentally, mm -hmm. but yeah, raising um, questions. I mean, you say that, I mean, there's many things in, in your article and what's what's mm. really interesting, of course, is that you spent exactly, it's one hour, 40 minutes with Vladimir mm. Putin in May 2019, which mm. is quite a long time. Um, is, is this, you, you, you say that he, you know, he may, and, and I think this has been considered that he may, uh, you know, press, press a nuclear button, but um, how desperate do you think he is right now to have some kind of success. I mean, seriously desperate. I mean, he's he's put his reputation at stake such as it is. I mm. mean, I, that interview uh, that we did in the Kremlin after midnight, uh, he likes to talk after midnight, was chilling in, at times because you, you could see someone who has utter contempt for the liberal West. He actually said in the interview that the liberal idea was obsolete. He he talked about the West, Western decadence and a a narrative of decline. Mm. So, so I, I, I remember asking him, well, do you think your risk appetite has increased the longer you've been in power? Mm. And he said, well, those who do not take the risk do not get to drink the champagne. Oh, goodness, yeah. And, you know, we've allowed him to think he can get away with this. 
We have not been robust enough early enough in our assistance to Ukraine. And now we're in a, a very serious conflict. There may be some diplomatic options, shouldn't completely rule that out. Mm. And we can talk about that. Mm. Um, Sophia, do you agree that we were not robust enough uh, when it came to Ukraine? I mean, I think certainly we were sleepwalking on the threat that Russia poses uh, to European security and, and indeed global security. I think, you know, we have obviously allowed Putin to create energy supply chain deficiencies and sorry, de dependencies, which, you know, were, were very much anticipated warnings were given and we still went ahead. We've allowed, you know, Russian money to entangle itself into our financial, legal and uh, even political systems. So I think, you know, absolutely we uh, dropped the ball. Um, and also, you know, we allowed pretty petty differences ultimately in the scheme of things to come between us in the West. And, you know, Putin's been watching all of that very carefully. And, and, you know, he's an opportunist. He's chosen this moment because he looked at what happened in Afghanistan. He looked at Merkel's departure. He looked at all the bickering that was going on between the UK and the EU and so on um, over fishing and all the rest and said, you know, I'm, I'm actually willing to bet that the West might not rise to this challenge. Now we have regrouped and got our act together now, but I think this question of what comes next is, is really, uh, it's quite opaque and, and difficult to penetrate. I mean, I think there's kind of three key things that we need to be thinking about now. The first is we have to maintain a relentless degree of pressure. We can't allow there to be any sense that we're developing fatigue because Putin, he will just try and grind down. He's shown that he's willing to sort of fight for the death on this. Um, we also need to make sure that we're upping the ante on the equipment that we're providing both kind of practical and military and of course also humanitarian assistance. Um, we've just been sending a bunch of sort of uh, power generators over. I mean, all of these sorts of things do add up and they are important. But I think the third thing that we really need to start getting our head around is what does the aftermath look like? Um, and what is going to be the role of um, other European countries and the United States, NATO more generally, um, in supporting a kind of reconstruction? And what kind of pathways are we going to be looking to offered to Ukraine um, to help guarantee their security in the future. Lionel, Sophia says that we should keep up relentless pressure. Would you agree with that in terms of economic sanctions? Absolutely, Jenny. I think you need to turn the tourniquet. And that means a, an energy boycott. Uh, it means an oil and gas boycott. It means asking the Germans, who, by the way, have moved an enormous degree. If you think where they were on swift sanctions, these these tactical nuclear mm financial sanctions, shutting them off from the um, banking, Western banking system, global payment system. That was a huge move. We need to go another step further. We really need to inflict economic pain so that Putin realizes, one, we're united, and two, we're prepared, as Sophie says, um, Sophie says that, we're, that we're in here for the medium to long haul. Sophia, do you worry that we might be creating a generation of disaffected uh, Russians resentful at, at the way that Western sanctions ha have destroyed their country or, or are in the process of destroying their country? I think this is one of the most important tasks of this aftermath. And obviously, when we talk about aftermath, it's, mm. I, I don't feel there's going to be any clean end to this. But, you know, I think we really need to think about, obviously, how we can create pathways for a, a liberal and open future for the Ukrainian people. But we also need to recognize, you know, look at these extraordinary people out in the streets in Russia, mm. you know, risking imprisonment and worse um, to protest against the war. These people are yearning for a more liberal, free and open future for themselves. We need to think about how we tap into those people. We need to keep lines of communication open and of course Putin is doing absolutely everything he can to sort of wind that back and and balkanize Russia from the rest of Europe and the West um, but we need to think really creatively and you know it might be things like student exchanges uh, immigration pathways and so on in a way that we have done with um, our generous uh, BNO scheme to Hong Kong so I think we need to think about you know, in the longer term, this is not just going to be about infrastructure. It's not just going to be about political union and uh, Ukraine's economic recovery. This is also a people to people story um, about the hearts and minds. Very quickly, don't forget China. 
There is a report in the Financial Times, mm. also in American newspapers, that the Russians have asked China for assistance, uh, that, whether that's drones or military equipment. So there is a serious risk of escalation in that respect. And also, this is a test for where China is. Are they going to risk further Western sanctions? Are they going to, you know, turn this relationship they have with Russia into a partnership or even an alliance? This is very dangerous. Absolutely. Um, uh, continuing coverage of uh, the crisis in Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine, of, of course, throughout the day here on uh, Times Radio. But uh, we're searching around for something to lighten uh, the tone a little bit. And earlier on, uh, we heard uh, a beautiful sound, and it was Shirley Bassey, who performed at the BAFTAs yesterday at the age, wait for it, of 85. <laughs> What a, <laughs> what a woman, what a voice. I mean, I feel 85 when I get up at three o'clock in the morning. Um, Lionel Barber, what do you hope to be doing at the age of 85? Well, I was going to say still singing Goldfinger in my bath, but actually riding my bike. Riding and it bike. can be done. Mm -hmm. I have one or two friends in America in their early 80s, yeah. and they're happily cycling 30-plus miles in heat mm -hmm. uphill. Yeah. If I can do that at 85, Amir, I'll be very happy. I was all, all very struck. Uh, um, I was always very struck by um, the, the beach Ipanema, where all, all the Brazilians go jogging, including the 85-year-olds, <laughs> and they are in great shape. Uh, Sophia, what do you hope to be doing at 85? I know that's a long way off for you, but w w what do you hope to be doing? <laughs> Um, I mean, what won't I be doing? I think, you know, it's very much a case of use it or lose it, isn't it? So um, I hope I'm still living a fabulous life and growing through the world with curiosity and courage. Let's hope so. What about you, Jenny? Well, I'm still planning to be a rock star one day. So at 85, <laughs> I hope I'm going to be on stage singing Diamonds Are Forever. That's my plan. Wow, yeah. I was going to say I'll join you on vocals, but I'll be considerably older by then on backing vocals. Thank you to both of you, to Lionel Barber, former uh, editor of the Financial Times, and to Sophia Gaston, director of the British Foreign Policy Group Think Tank. And thank you as well for getting in touch with all your comments and tweets.